think there's a lot of there's a lot of elements to 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 fast fashion or what I would consider making it fast. One is that you know is that there used to be let's say four seasons a year. Now there seems to be an unlimited amount of seasons and drops per year. So the the pace at which clothing is being churned out is incredibly quick. The pace at which clothing is being consumed is incredibly quick. So if I if I went back to my grandmother's generation, um, they they might have had one or two outfits at a time, one or two uh, dresses at a time, which they would have been repairing and repairing and repairing and repairing and repairing, and only replacing when things were completely worn out and patched many times. Now you've got whole wardrobes full of full of clothes. In, in some cases, clothes you no longer um, wear or never have worn. So, so that's an issue. Even when um, you have this eco ideal of an item that should be should be worn at least thirty times, I, I, I think thirty times is still too fast. You know, I have a black V neck jumper that I bought from Marks and Spencer when I first moved to the UK in two thousand and four. I wear it at least once a week and have done since 2004. This is hundreds of times that I've worn this jumper. Okay. So it's, it, it's, it's a very versatile color. It's a very versatile fit. It's not memorable, which means that nobody notices as if you wear it many, 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 many times. And I think that a lot of people wouldn't describe it as fashion. They might describe it as clothes but what it certainly isn't is fast. So there's the production of clothing is too fast. The consumption of clothing is too fast. And then you have, because of the, the pace of those two things, you have all of the, the, the wraparound industry being too fast as well. So things have to be couriered and airmailed instead of being sent th through the, the post, which is slow. You have designers which are burning out because they're being constantly asked to come up with new ideas, even though most of the ideas in fashion that I see anyway are just rehashings of what happened before and what happened before and what happened before. You know, it's very rare that you see something truly creative, truly innovative, which is um, almost obscene for an industry that calls itself creative. So, so you've got, you know, farmers that that simply aren't being paid well enough. You have garment workers that aren't being paid well enough. You have A whole supply chain which based degradation and human exploitation and that's because of the pace and the demands that are being put on every single person in the supply chain whether that be you know the design team the sourcing team the buyers the cutters the packers the pick and packers the amazon courier drivers the fedex drivers you know there's 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 pace everywhere and now we even have you know customers who expect things to be delivered the same day or within a few hours. And they also expect free returns, which is, all, all, and all of this is unsustainable. And all of it is, is based around this really bizarre idea of, of, of speed and that you have to be bang on trend and that you, 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 that you have to be wearing whatever is of the moment. So, so fast fashion is essentially um, social and environmental annihilation wrapped up as a creative bonbon and sold to the yeah it's sold to to people who probably can't afford it anyway i mean it's it's just a hideous hideous mess mm -hmm. how do you um how do you think we're going to change that because obviously some would say that fashion is consumer driven but then some would say that it's not consumer's responsibility or they, will, they won't change it if it's offered? Or where do you think the responsibility lies for that kind of shift to change towards a slower model? It's, it's everyone's responsibility. It is the consumer's responsibility. It is the producer's responsibility. It is the government's responsibility to actually, you know, actually enforce the modern slavery laws that we have. It, it is every aspect of the supply chain has responsibility everybody is participating in it so 
I don't think you can blame one group or the other in the same way that 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 we have this you know polarizing politics over over certain issues i and that's because everyone wants to blame someone else and that generally isn't isn't them so consumers generally want to blame the producers producers want to blame the consumers um government doesn't want to be blamed by anyone but generally takes the biggest part of the blame but we are all responsible for it and and in particular the people who are the most responsible for it are the people who have a choice okay so i think it's really unfair it to it, the the unfairness is in the system really are meted out to the people who are least able to deal with the consequences and that would be you know garment workers and farmers and factory, factory workers So we, that's that anyone in, in that category, because a lot of those people don't have, have much choice. But what we should be offering is better, better jobs, more secure jobs, um, and, and, and different kinds of employment where perhaps they still make gar garments but because they were paid better. And the materials that they used were more environmental. They would cost more to the consumer who would then buy less. And maybe the producer would make less profit and that profit would be more evenly distributed across the supply chain, but we would then start to have a more sustainable system. It would slow down. Yeah. Um, as kind of like a key player in that arm of the industry, are you starting to see the shifts that need to happen or is there still a really long way to go or, you know, where are we at with it? Well, certainly there is a bit of a shift. So you, It's a different what it was in 2005 when we started, but at the same time, the pace among the fast fashion brands has sped up. So there was an incredible report that was written by the Union of Concerned Researchers in Fashion. Um, I think it came out in a couple 2019, maybe just prior to the Copenhagen Fashion Summit opening, and it said despite all of the announcements and all of the changes that have been made over the last 10 years, the the, the pace in the, within the industry, which has picked up so considerably and the quantities and the volumes, which have increased so dramatically, wipes out any positive change whatsoever. And this is where we really have to be careful of saying, yeah, isn't it great that such and such large brand has a tiny capsule collection, which is eco and ethical, because really that's just an attempt to make, every, you know, create a veneer of greenness that covers the, the rest of the damage that they're causing and it's in a, it's an inappropriate response so have there been changes yes but the fastest growing fashion businesses in the uk are not slow businesses they are fast they are exploitative and they degrade the environment cool. um i mean not cool but um thank you that was really interesting to listen to um I was going to move on to kind of talking about waste because I know that's Elvis and Cressy's like bag um, mm. and obviously the fashion industry um, is quite bad on waste. So I was kind of wanting to discuss what the biggest waste areas are and how you think they can be addressed. You know, the, the waste is, waste is, um, is, is fascinating. I, I think that you can really understand a, a culture and a society based on what it values and what it doesn't value. And if you went, you would, you would not really find evidence, vast evidence of landfills if you went back in archaeological time. You know, you, you would find, you know, bits of clay pot or whatever, but largely that's organic material and can go back into the earth this burying this mass burying of stuff we no longer want is very much a modern invention the mass incineration of things that we no longer want is a modern um invention and all of it stems from the onslaught single use goods whether that be single use plastics for food on the go whether that be single use packaging for all of the 
parcels that arrive at our door, whether that be single use clothing or no use clothing. So we, we, we just have far too many things that are designed with unbelievably durable and wonderful materials and are then used once. And even if you are recycling those, that's still a defeat because you've used up too many precious resources in the first place for, for one event. And that's really, in a, that's in a really inappropriate use of something, something wonderful. You know, if you think about climate change, fossil fuels are a single use good. When you burn them, they're in the atmosphere. And this took tens of millions of years of, 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 not, of the world working in the way it did to, to have organic material compress under layers of soil to create fossil fuels in the first place, i.e. we cannot create them again. And we have in one century literally burned through a lot of them. So that's a single use good. I think, yes, the waste is, for me, is, is, is all tied up in this idea of, the, of the, single, the single use or minimal use good. And we need, to, we need to depart from that and start getting back to cherishing things. And, that's, and I think if we cherish things, and we cher it, 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 it will all help us to cherish other people, to cherish the time we have, to cherish the environment, um, as opposed to being a part of this throwaway culture oh can't fix it chuck it yeah it, it, it's a it's a cultural problem yeah i um i interviewed someone from a company um that is trying to um turn coffee like used coffee grounds into um like sustainable um alternatives like palm oil like an alternative to palm oil and stuff and he said that he this revive revive eco yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're great. They're great. Yeah, they're really cool. I, such an exciting idea. Um, but yeah, Scott from Revive said that he thinks that um, like recycling kind of builds a culture of like allowing waste to exist in the first place because it kind of placates people and lets them think that they're, you know, oh, if it's recyclable, it's fine. Um, which yeah. actually, I think we need to change the narrative around that and move away from like recycling being obviously recycling is a good option if there's no other option but we need to think one step before that um yes like we, like we're making all of these items from plastic waste captured from the sea but why do we have plastic waste in the sea exactly yeah mm. um one so it, this kind of like sparked um a question i because i i um recently wrote to this um uh uh, vitamin company that I buy from um, because they send me vitamins once a month um, and their packaging like every month their packaging comes and I use my vitamins and then at the end of the month I have this really perfectly good plastic bottle that I feel awful just throwing straight into recycling because it's such a good little thing so I emailed them and asked them if they could possibly start doing like a return scheme so I could send back a bottle and they'd refill it and they came back and said that they wish they could but there was a lot of re regulation around um being able to refill stuff in that industry um mm. is there stuff like that in the fashion industry that kind of prevents so so what's Cressy's um Elvis and Cressy's um kind of packaging um process and and is there any regulation that prevents you from kind of eliminating single use in that area no so it so in in food and, and in health yes there's issues i mean i i remember working uh with someone years ago who was trying to come up with a biodegradable um package so that you could reuse um you could and reuse acupuncture acupuncture is this kind of natural um process and they felt that it was obscene that it involved so much plastic single-use plastic um, but in fashion no there's there's no such restriction and actually we make our own packaging from tea sacks which is a, a paper composite waste that is produced by the tea blending businesses in the uk and it can't be recycled because it's a series of layers of paper and then aluminum foil and polymer so we we make our own packaging from, from that material giving it giving it a second life 
Um, and there are there are definitely no restrictions. So uh, what I do I do find it quite funny in fashion when people are like, oh, but we have no other choice. We have to use this kind of packaging, and I just like, mm. yeah. <laughs> or have you just not bothered to do some research and find some alternatives, or are you so to the idea of um, or close-minded to the idea of what your customers might actually really cherish and enjoy. So we, we, the number of emails that we get from our customers about how much they love the packaging, how much um, the customers that we get that send it back for us to use it again at their own cost is pretty outstanding. Mm -hmm. And I just think, you know, how many, how many customers of some of the big luxury, luxury brands are getting, you know, constant flow of emails like that. I doubt any. So I do, I do think that there could be a lot more done in this space. Um, I'm in the in the B Corp space where where we are. So that we're one of the I don't know if you know what a B Corp is, but it's a kind of business that's signed up to um, all kinds of wonderful things. Um, but mostly we're certified against, you know, how we work with our supply chain, how we work with our colleagues, what our business model is, how we contribute to the environment, etc, etc, etc. But there's a lot of B Corps that are coming together to to work solution within the um, courier space because a lot of the there's a global shortage on cardboard which has a lot to do with covid and the fact that lots of people are staying home and ordering things in which means more usage of cardboard and yes cardboard can be recycled but only a certain number of times and it would make sense for us to have reusable solutions in that space so there's there's certainly some work being being done on that but it's very early days and it's going to be a logistical nightmare um but you know we've they're they're they've cracked reusables in some beauty and some food so looped works is has cracking it with you know has trialed reusable stainless steel pots with ben and jerry's and with i think with ben and jerry's and with hog and does i'm right so i so it's not like it can't be done. We just need a system in place to encourage it. And, and a lot of people are, you know, willing to change. I, 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 you know, one of the things I really enjoy in the UK is um, a curry takeaway. Certainly growing up in Western Canada, this was not something we had access to, but I can't handle the, the waste. I can't handle it. I, it just, it means that I wouldn't enjoy the food. So the, the, so what we've discovered is if you just take a bunch of your Tupperwares in, obviously not possible at the moment, but if you take your Tupperwares in, they'll just fill them up for you and are actually quite happy to do so because packaging is a big cost for the takeaway industry. And if you're, you're saving the packaging, then it's great. I remember um, when I lived in Hong Kong, there was a soup delivery service that had stainless steel um, thermos canisters and you paid a deposit when you became part of this soup delivery system and you got your soup three days a week and they would just bring you one and take one away, bring you one and take one away. And it worked perfectly. I never, I was never worried about hygiene. I was never, never even remotely concerned about it. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've got that, um, I've got a little like, stainless steel pot that I go and pick my coffee up from from my um, local coffee shop around the corner and there's just something really enjoyable about about having something that is like forever and that you can take back and you have a conversation with the person who's selling you the product and you know you get to know them and like um, if everything in our cupboards um, and in our kitchen became reusable as well like it's just so much more aesthetically pleasing which I know is really not that important but I don't know it just it I don't know I think there's just something so much nicer about would be something so much nicer about a world where we don't have single use and we have things that we reuse and and also how how wonderful is that experience for you because so 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 they are getting the, the benefit for them is wow what customer loyal not going to get coffee anywhere. but you you know human beings as a result of that and I think, I think if we're going to get over a lot of the cultural challenges that we, that we face, which contribute dramatically to climate change and fast fashion and all, the, and all of these other things and sort of, you know, rising inequality and selfishness and um, then these kinds of relationships that you form within your community over daily 
you know, goods that you use every day are, is actually quite important. So yes, it might be, it might be more aesthetic, but it's also a more heartfelt and more enjoyable and, and, and probably better for people's mental health if they're engaging in, with other people in a positive way. Yeah, I, can, I completely agree. Um, my next question was going to be, what advice would you give people wanting to cut their fashion footprint? I kind of, I mean, I, I would love to know what your advice would be for that as well, but I kind of wanted to instead ask, what would your advice be to people wanting to like affect change in the fashion industry? When the, or in, yeah, like how, how can consumers help to build this world that we've, you know, been talking about, build the shift? Yeah, so it is, it is, I mean, I've taken myself out of it because I don't participate in it. You know, uh, we, you know, I, if, if it's going to be, you have to sort of, research, if you're going to buy something new, you have to put a lot of research into it. You have to think long and hard about it. Is it going to be a durable good? Is it going to be something that you really want? So don't ever buy anything that you've just seen for the first time and go, yeah, I kind of like that. If, you know, it has to be something you think about for a long time. Or you can buy stuff, you know, secondhand on eBay. You know, I have a... Um, we, we do all of the, the photos that you see on our website are ones we take here. And that means you kind of have to have quite a few outfits to wear. And some of them are outfits I wouldn't normally wear. I don't really wear dresses very often, but I, I know, you know, I know what size I am in a couple of, of brands. So I buy those dresses on eBay and I wear them for a few photo shoots and then I clean them and I sell them on eBay and pass them on to someone else. And, and actually bizarrely from a financial financial perspective, I, I have suffered no net loss in that way. So a lot of these clothes retain their value, um, which is why I kind of don't understand the rental model because you, you pay for the use of it and it goes back. Whereas with the, e with the eBay bottle that I use, I'm, I'm you know, rev revenue flat as opposed to revenue down. Um, I, de I definitely would recommend, you know, getting into the second hand market. I definitely would recommend buying much less and thinking about the choices you make. And I definitely would recommend actually enjoying what fashion is. You know, there's a, um, Olivia Pinnock is, is sort of a great journalist in this space. And she says, well, I don't understand how we love fashion, but we hate clothes. And sort of what she means by that is we, we actually love, you know, wearing things that make us um, feel happy in ourselves, but we, we so despise of those clothes that we're willing to dispose of them so quickly. And actually, I think people have to get better at expressing who they are through combinations of clothes or just understanding what really makes them feel good. I've, I've understood for a long time that skinny jeans don't make any sense to me. <laughs> I don't, they, I just don't understand what's supposed to happen to them at your ankle. And <laughs> how, and, and in, where I grew up, if you wore jeans inside your cowboy boots, that was like a, a, just a bizarre thing to do. So I've all, only ever worn boot cut jeans and I've had the same pair of jeans since I, um, I had the same pair of jeans since I, from when I was 17 till I was about 39 and then they finally died um, and had, you know, had to get another, uh, another pair because literally they were, there was no more patching that could be done. They were obscene. But why is that, why is that any less fashionable? I found a pair of jeans that, it worked and I felt great in them I felt comfortable in them if I you know you just have to iron a shirt and the same the same sh and don't buy a white shirt buy a black shirt because because it's easier to give it a long life if it's not white um yeah so I don't own any white clothes I uh either because I think they're for me they're a disaster I don't understand white trousers it's, a, it's to me it's a disaster because it's, they're not going to stay white they're not going to have a long life um but yeah I think you just have to take yourself out of it and not participate in it and then and then you have to sort of think about what are you going to do with your time and your talent and your skills and what I really want I mean you're at your university that's right is that right um, no no I'm I'm Paul Prince content manager Okay. Oh, that, I'm talking to somebody tomorrow from Edinburgh University. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really weird. Um, but you can put, you can decide what you put your time and your energy into. And I don't think we should be, you know, so there's lots of young people that want to aspire to work in that industry. And I would rather them aspire to work in, you know, um, the development of 
biodegradable natural materials that didn't cost the earth or uh, renewable energy technology or you know social justice work I, I just think you know people have to put their put their energy into things that help regenerate the planet and make people love each other rather than things that that you know cause, are causing so much damage and so much pain yeah um that kind of i guess leads on to the next question which you've sort of already touched on in most of your answers but um obviously fashion's footprint isn't entirely um environmental there's also a lot of social injustice wrapped up in the industry which needs to be addressed mm -hmm. Um, as a company that believes in fair and ethical treatment of employees and that's been a B Corp for five years, can you share your thoughts on how businesses in the fashion industry can support climate justice and contribute to building an intersectional future? Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing question. So this is, and this is why climate change really is a cultural issue. So there's a lot of people who think, yep, we've got, we'll put in some technical fixes and then we can just keep running as normal. But as soon as you scratch below the surface and you understand that there is so much modern slavery in food and in fashion and in manufacturing in general and in the production of all the stuff that, that most people don't need and don't want and the churn of goods and the single use realm that we were talking about before, um, then we can't really address, uh, really address climate change because we're we're still the system is still unsustainable and by unsustainable i mean it's unsustainable for creating a good positive life for everyone involved in that particular system so it, it, if you're and and this actually is why we have um why, why nothing is simple why everything is complicated because some people are like oh no you can't have a plat um you can't buy a nylon shirt because of the micro the the, the micropolymers and the release into the oceans um, you have to buy a cotton shirt. Um, it has to be an organic cotton because we can't use chemicals and even organic cotton uses too much water. And we have this enormous problem in the countries that grow cotton um, with, 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 with farmers that are committing suicide because they're at being asked to continue to sell crops at totally unsustainable prices. We have an enormous amount of modern slavery being used in the processing of cotton largely around the Uyghur population. And, and these, so, so, so this, this enormous mess and climate justice and social justice are basically totally overlapped because we can't, unless we fix those, these social issues, we're not really gonna be able to address the climate issue. Unless we decide to stop the abuse of human beings and the environment at every level, in every country at the same time, then we're not really gonna be able to have climate justice. Because what we're saying is, is it's fine for people to live like in one way in one country, but that is all supported by a, 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 a much lower standard of living by other people in another country. And I just don't, I, and that's just, I don't know anyone who could, who could justify that. I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand the arguments for that. I understand that that's where we are, but I don't understand any business that isn't trying desperately to unpick its relationship with where we are. So any business that doesn't have an active roadmap to get away from where we are now is a business I have no time for, no patience for, and I actually think should be legally forced to close down. I mean, how, why not? 